zombie. It's a comedy, though. You want to talk a little bit about her comic? Sure. Like she said, it's a, it's a zombie comedy thing. We, uh, it's not too gory or anything. It's mostly humorous. It's kind of a parody of all the different zombie movies, because you know they're all popular right now. But I do all the writing and the coloring, and she does all the artwork and the lettering for it. Yes. So that's a little bit about the comic that we're showing here, and our table is way down, like it's one of the first ones when you come through Artist Alley, and we have our first issue for sale. But this panel, well, let's get started, so you can, okay. So let's just say we are. Um, I am, in addition to being the artist for Undead Norm, I'm an adjunct professor, I'm a part-time professor at Trident Technical College in Charleston, South Carolina. I teach animation but I also teach sequential art, which is comics. So I teach the really fun classes, guys. Like, it's really, really, really cool stuff. Um, I am a twice graduate of the Savannah College of Art and Design. I know that one of y'all's friends was really interested in that school. It's in Savannah, and, and you're interested. It's a weird, yes, it's a really good school. Once you're out of high school, both my degrees are in sequential art, so comics. It is a legit school. Like, it's, it's really, really cool. And then, Christine, tell us a little bit about your background. I'm mostly a self-taught artist, but um, Melanie helps me out. I attend panels at different conventions to learn more. But uh, I am the writer, and I just, I've just i written a couple of other stories. They haven't been published yet, but I also color for a comic based out of Chicago called Disco Frankenstein. <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm working on coloring a superhero comic for someone else. Alright, so that's a little bit about us. <laughs> and I'll break the table. <laughs> I'd be more worried about the computers and tablets. Yeah. Uh, Especially the table. first one since it's not mine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so you want to get started industry. Well, we have been featured on, um, we did go to Heroes Convention, which is up in Charlotte. If you like comics and want to go to a, like, comic con, that's all comics all the time, this is more of a gaming con, uh, Heroes Convention in Charlotte is the one to go to. And when we went, we were interviewed by Comic News Insider, which is a podcast that is hosted by Jimmy Aquino. We were also interviewed by Web Studio D. It's a web comics um, website. They feature different web comics. Um, also, just locally, um, Soundwave Music and Movies. That's our comic shop. Like up here, y'all have Heroes and Dragons. Is y'all's comic shop down in Somerville? It is Soundwave Music and Movies. Um, yeah, like we we've, we've done a lot of stuff locally. All right. So, you want to get started? Comic industry, you want to do this, all right? So we're going to talk a little bit about the steps that it takes from the very beginning all the way until a published book. Okay. So you need to know your market first. You probably have heard about some of these, if not all of these types of comics. Um, the first type is Main Street. So Marvel and DC. You see all the movies that are out now. It's all superhero type of stuff. It's based mainly within America. We also have manga. I know that quite a few of you were into manga at this con, so that's very um, that's based in Japan, Far East, and you read those comics from right to left. Versus in America, you read it from left to right. Let's see. Uh, we also have independent comics. So if you go to Burns and Noble and you look in the graphic novel section and you see those really thick ones, those are more independent. Um, they're smaller publishers. So Image, Dark Horse, Top Shelf Comics, Slate Labor Graphics, those are all independent publishers. All right. There's also others. Um, there's European comics. Um, how many of you saw the, the movie Tintin? Or, okay, Tintin is based off of a European comic. And over in Europe, how they work is comics are almost like fine art over there. And those artists spend up to a year making those comics. They're like they're really top, high, high shelf art there. There's also web comics. We do a web comic. And I know that you probably read other web comics on the internet. 
So I've seen a lot of people here cosplay as Homestuck characters. I I like Emma's Pain Adventures, Homestuck. The, the what? It confuses me, but I like <laughs> <laughs> Well, people like that guy who started that comic, it's all I mean, web comics on the internet. You have a website, you update um, your pages, or in his case, like his one panel, whatever chapter, once a week or about. We do ours once a week, and then Christine, you can talk a little bit about um, the Undead Knob, too. Yeah, and on, on Thursdays I do a little short comic strip. It's not really part of the main story, but it's like a little cutesy, goofy take on the story. Just It's usually like maybe three panels at a time. But that's updated once a week as well, so it's part of that goes with the web comic type of feel. Then the last type is a mini comic. You may not, you might see those here, you may not see those here, but mini comics, they're really more alternative. Like, if you really like, if you want to make comics really bad, but you don't have thousands of dollars to make your books and publish them, you start out by making mini comics, and it is, as it sounds, or mini booklets that you make, you go to Kinko's and make copies of like 500 comics and you have folding parties, you fold them, staple them, and then you trade with other artists. That's how it usually works. So if you go to a con like Heroes or if you go to San Diego Comic Con, you would trade and you could, you know, network and get some nice other artists there. But many comics, things like really low budget, anyone can make them. I've taught elementary kids on making comics like that's <laughs> they're, they're real easy to make. So writing your story, how many of you like to write? Okay, so y'all are more the writers. All right, good. All right. I'm sorry, I keep on like. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. It's like I feel the stern look on it. <laughs> so whether you're writing it on your own or if you hire someone, okay, so the way how we work, Christine writes the story for Undead Norm. I'm not in charge of story at all, but there's a method behind it. Make sure if you're the one writing it, your story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Even if it's a long-running series, like you can't, if you just have an ambiguous ending, it might be a sequel, but there needs to be at some point in your story an ending to the story. And then when you write an actual script, like do you all write scripts for your stories? Okay. If you don't, start thinking in a script form. If you take a look at screenplays, or if you've ever acted in a play at your school, that's how comics are written. And you can talk a little bit about that as well, since you are the writer of <laughs> Well, I mean, the best thing about writing is when you're writing it, no one uses their first draft. Just write it down, go back and redo it. You know, it's just, don't feel self-conscious about it. And one of the easiest things to do the writing is do the beginning and then set your end. It does not have to be finalized, but it's easier to have a goal to get to in the middle. It'll happen. You can get it in there. Just always let someone else proofread too because it might make sense to you. And in your mind you're saying this is this is awesome. But you know, some other someone else might get lost if the story doesn't make sense. Yeah, and there might be loss in translation between, like, if the writer has something down, the artist might think something differently, too. And that's something that has happened with us, where <laughs> Christine will write down, panel one, I want this to happen. And this character says this, but I have changed it. I'll add a character, I'll take away a character, I'll sometimes combine panels. But we talk about it though, I, I will say why that happens. As long as you have a good like friendship or relationship with your writer, if you're the artist, or a good relationship with your artist if you're the writer, everything will work out. Yeah. And there's a lot of people who don't do yes. that. Like some people want you to strictly stick to the script. If you have a set panel layout you want them to do, do a little thumbnail of it for them. Yes. That helps out a lot. It does, yes. <laughs> yeah, the most important panel on your page um, is called the payoff panel. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. All right, good. I'm sure that this next one's going to look really familiar to you all. And I'm sure that you've seen that. <laughs> in school. Yes. If you, Flashback to ninth grade English. Yes. <laughs> if you have read Shakespeare or any type of 
dramas and type of story. Um, Hated Romeo and Juliet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a tragedy. For you. <laughs> this can actually, I show this to my students and they're in college. It is important. Like, if you want to write your story, you've got to have that pyramid. So you have that inciting action, you have that climax, and you have that conclusion. <laughs> Just basic, basic steps for writing a really effective story. Okay? And then keep in mind, if, if this is something that you want to do, um, continue doing, you can do it anywhere you are. You can attend writing classes. If there's a writing group at, a group at your school or creative writing classes, writing your spare time. If it's something that you're really passionate and love to do, um, I would just continue writing. All right, so now what about drawing it? Now, are y'all writers, or do, or do you, well, you draw. Yes. Yes. Uh, I can't draw. You just save my life. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm better at drawing and coloring than writing. Okay. I'm the same way. I always work with a writer. I'm, I never write my own stuff. I probably have to work with her. Yes. Alrighty, so, how do you get started drawing it? So, first things first, guys. Just because you draw comics doesn't give you an excuse to not know how to draw anything else. And what I mean by that is you see all the superhero people, you see all the really cartoony stuff on Cartoon Network. Those artists know how to draw real life things. They draw stuff like this. I mean, not all the time, but they know how to draw them. They know how to draw people. And I'm not talking like cartoon people, I'm talking like life drawing, like models. There are websites, and I know that you're really interested in that, there are websites you can go to. Um, Cosmeniacs.com, have you heard of that? Yes, that's a really good resource. Like, if you want to start drawing people, doing different actions, they've got over 1,400 poses or whatever it is on that website. And they also have them timed. So, if you want to draw a figure for 30 seconds, 90 seconds, 10 seconds, they've got it. So I would highly suggest, like, you need to know how to draw more than just a chibi face, or because when you're drawing your story, you need to know how to draw your characters doing everything. That's the nice thing about being a cartoonist is you can wow people, and you can show them that you know how to draw more than just cartoons. So that's bottom line, you need to know how to draw everything in this field, <laughs> and it's tough. See. Practice, definitely practice. Take classes on fine art. I know that you're in high school. Are you taking, and you like to draw too, are y'all taking art classes? Or? Um, I'm homeschooled, so we're still looking for art classes and stuff. Okay, now are you? I, um, okay, do you do you practice on, on your I'm self taught. Oh, okay, gotcha. Definitely like pick up some books at Barnes and Noble, look at tutorials on YouTube. Like, that's how you get started. All right. So from there, um, you need to, when you write your story or you have a writer who has given you a story, the first step of drawing a comic, you do what's called pre-production. If you're, you want to get into animation, same deal. Pre-production is the fun stuff. It's character design and it's a little bit of um, doing all of your thumbnails. I'm sure that you don't start like straight on your final page. You have to do a rough draft, right, of whatever you're drawing. So definitely, you know, do all those sketches first time around. Because you may not like, similar with writing, you may not like what your first draft is. You may have to refine it a little bit. So if you get all of that stuff out of the way, then you start working on pages. So here are some examples. Um, the first one is a model sheet, and you'll see in animation that there might be a character. If you buy like all the concept art books for Star Wars, or um, I'm sure My Little Pony has something out there <laughs> of um, an art book, um, you'll see all these character designs blow up on now. There's also environments. Um, if your comic happens to take place somewhere really specific, you may want to draw a lot of the backgrounds. I know like backgrounds are one of those things where artists are like, do I really have to draw that over and over? Yes. <laughs> um, if you can draw backgrounds, 
you'll be like way up here within <laughs> comics industry. Trust me. Um, and this example actually is from a classmate of mine. He does, um, that was his thing, he does uh, concept art and for games and stuff. Like if, if you like just drawing characters and drawing environments, that can be your full time job in the animation world, just creating characters all day for animation. That's pretty sweet. All right. So once you get started, you thumbnail out your page. So you draw, you have them really small, you do your little rough draft. What, are, what is your page going to look like? So Christine will write a page for me, and then I just happen, you know, I draw out. It might take like four or five times in order to make it look correct. But that's, it's very similar to this right here. All right. From there, um, after you take your thumbnails, you make a bigger size. Now, we work in a more traditional size. Um, so our tight rough, which is, here is a really good example, our tight rough is five by seven and a half inches. Now, this girl was also a classmate of mine, and we had a Batman assignment. And our Batman assignment took place um, in the late 1800s. And she used a blue pencil. Now, I don't know if there's a lot of art supply stores around here, I don't know. But there are special pencils that are blue, and they're called non-photo blue. So when you scan them, it's like an, an invisible pencil. It all disappears. So I, you know, you, I don't know if Michaels or AC Moore really has that, but they do. But, but you have to ask for them. <laughs> they keep it all hidden. <laughs> but in animation too, they'll use the blue pencil. They'll use um, red pencils as well. So if you want, if you're really interested in getting into that, um, that's the type of pencil that you would use, all right? And then from there, um, that's when you pencil your page. So you probably have seen other artists at this convention or other ones will have the big pages laid out and they're all penciled. And we use what's called Bristol War. You can find that at Michael's too. It's a thicker, heavier paper, more durable, okay? And from there you can ink. Now, when you ink, I'm sure that probably a lot of you use the tech pens, right? Yeah, like the, you, you, um, do you ink your comics? Um, sometimes. Okay, do you mostly pencil? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't really use Photoshop, like darkening lines. I talk about that, yeah. Like that. Lazy. <laughs> Actually, it's not being lazy because no. it's something that you know more people are using today. A lot of people do Illustrator. Yes. For it too. And then I use side, or like I use yeah. side with inking to do the lines. Yes. This makes it like I'm, I have OCD about like. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> <laughs> Everything needs to be perfectly straight to curvy. It has to be the way it needs to be. And plus, it's, it's always. Yeah. It's always true black too if you use a computer program. So like here, you know, if you use a more traditional way, yeah, you know, you can use pens. You can use really like less and less people are using the dip pens. You can just use the type pens for that. Sometimes people use garage. So our our next slide shows, you know, an example of those are the great tools. I'm sure that like you probably all have like at least one or two of those pens in your bag or something. You can find those at Michael's very easily. But yes, um, the digital inking is coming alive, yes. <laughs> so a really old version of Photoshop, but you would scan in your pencils, and then on top of it, yes, you could use brush or illustrator. You could use your pencil and go over that, and it's, it's way better um, for web comics, okay? So, now let's talk about coloring, and Christine is the colorist for Undead Norm, so you do you want to talk a little bit about your process? Yeah. Well, um, first thing I start off with is cleanup. Sometimes you'll have very, very, very clean line art, sometimes you won't. Usually, like, since most people are moving towards doing visual inking, it'll be very clean already, so you don't have to worry about yes. doing much, but, you know. If, if, like, sometimes when Melanie, Melanie has pretty good artwork, but it's like sometimes I have to clean up because her paper catches stuff in there. But uh, do that, and then um, I do all my, my lines, all the cleanup and stuff in Photoshop. 
then I do the flats. I like to put different colors in different layers. Some people like to put them all in the same. Usually I'll put them all in different layers, then combine them. And then I do, a, for Undead Norm, I just do a, um, a separate layer and do a color overlay over it to like darken it. And usually I use like blues or browns, depends on what's going on. Because you know, with the color you're setting the mood. Yes. And um, I suggest, you know, learning more about color theory helps out a lot with that because, you know, if it's a sad, sad event, you don't want pinks and stuff everywhere, <laughs> you know. And I mean, like, you wouldn't draw it like my little thing. <laughs> but um, you wouldn't color like that. But, you know, it's, yeah. you're setting the moods and you always want the stuff that's in the foreground or the main focus to be darker. Then, or you know, or contrasting color where everything's paying attention to that. Draw the eyes to it. But you know, a lot of times your inkers will already det determine where the color source is, what color, the light source is, and the, the depths of a. Uh, it brings focus to it anyway. Yes. But your backgrounds, traditionally, a lot of pastels are used for it. But um, and your your main heroes will usually be in primary colors or some sort of shades of it. And then, um, you know, there's a lot of villain colors like the green and, and um, purple are usually used for villains, and you know, Joker and things like that. Yeah. Always, always look at uh, lots of comics. I suggest looking at all kinds of different comics and cartoons. See what other people use and you can use that to inspire what you do. That's a really good point about how red, yellow, and blue are used for superheroes and versus like Joker is green, purple, and white, or, or, or black, and that's more secondary colors. Like seriously, remember in kindergarten learn color wheel? That's real, like it, Christine really uses that. And then as far as, you know, she's right, whatever's in the foreground is going to be much brighter than in the background. It's going to be those pastel colors. This is a good example, actually. The yes. <laughs> you see how it's all light in the background just because you want to take the focus away from what's back there. Yes, you want them to know that Ponyville's back there. And, but um, the characters, you see, they're all, they're all brighter and it brings attention to it. Exactly. <laughs> and then, I don't know if, if you all have learned this, but there's a special term in art. If you look at paintings um, in museums and stuff like that, it's called aerial perspective. And that's, yeah, that's exactly what Christine is talking about. So yes, you can use Curl Painter. Christine uses Photoshop. Um, I mean, I, I rarely hear people using Adobe Illustrator, but I think it can be used. It, de it depends on what you're doing. Because that, that's really... Flash games and stuff. But like you yeah. said, Psy. A lot of people like Psy. Yeah. But it is much like a coloring book. Um, if you are given the liner and you are coloring in the lines, more lines. All right? So that's an example. We have our line art and we have our colored piece. That's a splash page. Splash page in comics is the one page that's an illustration. All right. So after you're, you're done coloring it, you're going to want to letter it. And there's a few ways of doing this. Now, you all might do it by hand. That's something that there's a handful of people. They like drawing their own little word balloons and putting their own text in there. But it's becoming more and more common. My handwriting is awful. Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> Mine too. So you rely on programs to do it for you. And you can do it in Photoshop, but I do it more in Illustrator. You can download fonts, which is are pretty cool. But the problem, like, you need to make sure that when you download a font that you can reuse it on your comic because sometimes there'll, there'll be fonts for movies and you don't want to get in trouble if someone recognizes, you know, oh, that came from the, the Harry Potter movie. Like, you don't want to get in trouble for that. But no, it, it's, it's not too hard to do it, all right? So yes, do digital lettering. I highly suggest it. And as this guy, it, or, I don't know, uh, as, this guy here is saying, yes, digital lettering is awesome. Do you all need a TV? Okay. Uh, I think we got it right now. <laughs> We're good. I'll just set it down. 
But you can see from <laughs> this example, yeah, like this person has made their own little balloons using the tools in the program and they have put their text on top of it. Same thing with sound effects. You can, you know, think of think to back to the days of word art from I don't know if you all remember word oh art. <laughs> I always felt so cool when I was using word art. <laughs> <laughs> Think You're of the coolest kid when you have word out word on your poster in kindergarten. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but think of sound effects as being a much better version of word art today. You can do something similar for sound effects, all right. But yes, if you still want to hand letter it, I you know, that's <laughs> completely fine. <laughs> And there's a special tool, like, there are so many steps to this, but there's a special tool we'll call it an Ames lettering guide, and you basically put lines, and it spaces out all the letters, and then you can type it in using your hand. But <laughs> if you're not into that, then I would say definitely do the digital. It's easier to manipulate. Yes. <laughs> you don't want to, like, pour a whole thing of white out onto your your blend, so... Digital lettering is much better. So once you're done with your comic, like you've already made it, so what are you gonna do now? Okay, you have a few options. You can self-publish it. That's the easiest way to get your name out. You can go through a website called. Um, there's a few of them. There's Lulu.com. They're quite expensive. We use Kablam as our comic um, self-publisher. You can set up a website either through Comic Press. So that's what we did for our web comic. You can um, submit a packet to a smaller publisher. Marvel and DC don't do this anymore, so try to pick someone a little bit smaller. So a good example could be Top Shelf Comics or Alternative Comics, Slave Labor Graphics, Image, Dark Horse. They'll accept all of your stuff. Or you can go to comic conventions like this or Heroes or Animazement or any other convention that has comic artists. If you have a portfolio or if you have a mini comic, you can share it with other professionals and they will give you feedback on, you know, what what do you need to work on? Oh, I really like this. Oh, I, I love your book and I want I to publish it. Like, you just, you never know what you're going to get at the conventions. All right. So if you want to self-publish, you can just go to these websites. It does cost money, guys. Right. Um, talk yeah, a little bit about Kablam. Uh, Kablam, they, uh, they do a pretty good job. You can actually sell your comics through their website, Indie Planet. And they also have some digital format comics, too, that you can sell to them as well. It was pretty easy. You just hit sent the files to them, and they sent the comics back to us. They don't do digital groups anymore. But there are a few um, publishers that will give you proofs before you order a ton from them. Yeah. But usually those require more substantial orders, I think, in like the thousands. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. We're, we're not at that point yet. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, it's really simple. I, I've done books through Lulu.com. I did a color book. They're way more expensive. Like for an 18-page book, it costs like $24. That's that's quite expensive for our book. It's like it, it depends on how much you order. Yeah. But I mean, on average, it's about three dollars for our book, and it's 22 pages. So I mean, it also you know it just really depends on what you're seeking and looking for. All right. So you can also use um, Comic Press. Um, there's a new one. Yeah, they have an upgrade called Comic Use. I haven't used it yet, but so it's, it's, it's like a plugin for um, WordPress. So if you want to do web comics, like you have, you want to update once a week, you get this program, and it's real simple, and you make your updates. But through websites such as Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, all those social media networking sites, that's how you gain traffic. Sometimes you have to buy ads. We have ads on our page as well, and you just, you just like the old-fashioned way. You just tell all your friends and hope that they tell all their friends, and that's how you... Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's, it's becoming more popular to put comics on Tumblr, like just straight yes. flash through there. But you know you can reblog them so easily. And yeah, I read a lot of comics on Tumblr. So. Yes. It's an easy, clean type of site as well, like what what you can put up there. Well, I think it's you, you can't put ads on there, I don't think. But, yeah. you know, if you just want to get your name out there, it's awesome. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if you want to.
want to make a submission packet, um, if you have the next greatest idea ever, do you, in your y'all's case, like you're more manga, if you want to submit it to someone like Viz Media, um, they're the ones who do Bleach, they do, um, go ahead. Yes, they do. There's there's other independent um, manga that they publish as well, but for example, if you want to make a special packet for them, they're out in California, and you would create a packet, you would have your sample script, you would have a little bit of sample art, and a nice letter, you know, telling them, here, you should check out my comics, and it's all, like, in, in hope that they'll read it, and that they'll like it, and that they'll take you on. But it's got to be a smaller company, though. It can't be... Um, someone like Marvel or DC, because those people get so many submissions, like every 12 year old wants to draw the next editor, like, they just can't, you know, they can't accept everyone's. I think Dark Horse takes on that too. Yes, Dark Horse, it, but Dark Horse is also an independent, so really seek out all the independent publishers first. Okay, and then the last way is just to go to cons. Um, sometimes we'll do portfolio reviews, so if you have some really nice work and you want to show um, the artists that are there what you've been working on, they can give you feedback. They can tell you, this looks great, I think you should try this. Just really depends on who you meet with, um, but they will give you feedback. Sometimes they'll have one-on-one -on -one sessions too for like 10 minutes. That's a great opportunity if you have a, a card you want to give them, you give them a card and everything. Okay, yeah, well, we're at the... I was going to add something about the convention thing. Oh, good. If you go to a con as an artist or an, or an author, don't expect to be able to spend a whole lot of time doing fan stuff. So. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> they barely left their table the entire time they were there. Yes. So. But, I mean, like we, like we said, we got approached by people for interviews, and there's also a yeah. note about publishing. Some publish, any publishers will have tables at conventions, yes. and you can pitch your comic to them that way. Yes. Exactly. And if you do want to be an artist that uh, goes to the convention, you can set up a booth. It's real similar. Like here, you're part of Artist Alley. Um, and you just have your. Depends on the con. Um, Heroes, it costs us 300. How much does it cost to do? Yeah. I don't know. We get invited as we, we get invited. Um, a lot of the smaller con stuff. There's one, this four web comics called Inter Intervention Con up in Maryland. It's like 50 bucks a table. But That's the cheapest. You know, when you have the cheaper ones, if you want to go to it, or sign up early. They go yes. up real quick. But um, like San Diego Con is like a couple thousand. You don't, you know, yeah. you don't go yeah. there unless you're like really oh God, stuff no. to sell. <laughs> San Diego Con, they have to invite you. You have to have so many um, comics that have, a, have been published. They're on the upwards of like three thousand plus dollars for and, one. And even if you get invited, you still have to fill out an application. Like yes. Ron Mars, who is like a massive name, was griping on Twitter about having to fill out an application to show his prof professional credentials. I mean. Yeah. You would think somebody that big wouldn't have to, but even they have to. So I think AWA is in is in the hundreds. It's like close to if it's not already hundreds, over hundred now. Um, I want to say here. I think it was about I don't know, like forty. It's like was it forty? A lot of them, the smaller ones, around, it's usually like a hundred to hundred and fifty. And um, it also depends on how many days the con runs. Too. Yeah. Yeah, Cola Con up here is, I heard, I've heard it's 200, it's a 100 a day. And they do two days. Yes. So, if you think of it this way, you're, you're paying that much for the table, you better make sure that your comics sell or that you make enough sketch cards, like Christina sketch cards, or if you have toys and stuff, like try to make enough so that way you can at least There's a lot of artists that make their money at conventions just going around to different ones and selling prints and yeah. original sketches and stuff. You, there are people who can make living off of it. Or I have seen a lot of artists that would draw other characters. So you can, you know, if you really like those characters, you really like Applejack from My Little Pony, and you go up to an artist, they might draw a Superman, but a lot of times artists may bend and they may draw and, any um, character you like. Let's watch out for um, 
a lot of conventions, they'll let some ban fan art, some will let you do fan art as prints. I mean, original sketches, they don't care, but like for prints, you can do up to a certain amount or a certain percentage at your table. Like, you can't have all fan art. Most, yeah. most big anime conventions will not let you do more than like, I forget how many, but like, it just depends. Like, Otacon, I think it was like 10%, maybe wow. you couldn't have more. It just depends. You have to look at the rules, see what's allowed, you know, and of course, you know, a lot of them are like, you can't have adult stuff out at the table. Yeah. Stuff. I, I don't know if you'll do that. Now, but I'm just saying, you know, there's a lot of rules and regula regulations that you have to check each time. You might have to register a tax ID for the state. So it's just a lot this of This is like you have heavy to, stuff. Yeah. Like, definitely. It, it's like, an investment. Yeah. Start but it's out working. at smaller cons. Like, that's my like advice. Here. Yeah. This yeah. is a, a good one. Um, even like, I don't know if there's even smaller ones, like one day. Con. There, there's so there's um, Columbia. There's one in Charlotte. Um, it's actually tomorrow. Charlotte Comic Con. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There, and, but um, also don't be afraid to add like if you see other web comics or artists you like, see where they're going to, and you can also ask them how they like the convention. Yes, and how they got started. Because some are too. some are well organized, some are bad. You know, just research. <laughs> or you can start going to your comic shops and start talking with the owners, become friends with them, and seeing if there's any events or parties that you can be part of. That's how we have started down in Somerville. That's that's it.